Hey, Neka, welcome to the ACMA podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure, and welcome everyone who's listening in. My name is William Salmon with the ACMA, the Accreditation Council for Medical Affairs, and today I'm really uh, happy to have with me Neka Diminucci. Neka is a medical science liaison at Abbey, working in the neuroscience division. So again, welcome uh, to Neka. And you know, we get a lot of questions uh, at the ACMA about medical science liaisons and a medical science liaison profession and understanding the role and the value that BCMAS, or the Board Certified Medical Affairs Specialist Program, brings to the profession. So NECA really is a great person to have on the show because she's a relatively new MSL in the industry. So NECA, why don't we start out by maybe you kind of just telling us about your current role at AbbVie and, and what you do and how long you've been there. So... Um, Before I start, I just want to state a disclaimer uh, that everything I'm about to share today is my personal opinion and my personal view and is not representative of my current company, AbbVie, um, doesn't represent their views or or their opinion. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, Where do I even begin? (laughs) So right now I'm an MSL. I'm kind of young in the business. I just joined uh, my current company in February, so I'm just about eight months in. Um, but boy, have I learned a lot since I started. Um, so that's pretty much what I'm. So I'm a medical science liaison, um, and um, I don't know. Do you want me to talk about my journey to uh, how I got yeah. here, or you just want me to? Yeah, why don't we start by? Tell us your journey, so you know your background as a pharmacist and how you learned about the medical science liaison profession, and and what led you eventually to get to where you are today. Okay, so I'm a pharmacist by training. I obtained my PharmD from Temple University in Philadelphia several years ago. Um, after I graduated, I worked in pharmacy practice for 17 years. Um, before I started my current role. Um, Within that 17 years, I worked in the retail space. Um, I spent most of my time in the hospital, and then I did a little bit of managed care as well. And um, about a year ago, just as COVID was about to hit, uh, I was kind of like at a career crossroads. I knew I needed to be somewhere. Where that place was, I couldn't tell because I didn't even know that what I really wanted to do existed. Um, But it wasn't until a friend of mine who works in the industry called me up. So I just moved to the Georgia. I live in Georgia, by the way, moved to the Georgia area. And I started talking to her and I started explaining to her, I was like, you know, there's just this thing out there that I know is out there for me. I just don't have a name for it. Number one, I know I want to work in corporate America. I know I want a flexible schedule. Um, I said, said, I don't want to lose my clinical expertise. And then I want to do some business without having to sell anything. (laughs) So I was like, I don't know if this exists. And then she goes, that sounds like MS cell. I was like, what? MS what? And she's like, that sounds like a medical science. She's like, that's what I've been doing for years. I said, Really? I said, because I thought, you know, when I think about you guys, you're traveling a lot and you're probably a salesperson. She's like, uh-uh, it's not sales. And so she gave me a little bit of high level of what MSL was and said, you know, why don't you go research it a little bit and see whether it's something that you would like to do. And so that's what put the MSL thing in my head. And then I went online and I started to research MSL. As I'm looking at this, it's like the light bulb started going off. And all of a sudden, it's kind of, I, I just got up and I said, ah, that's what I want to do. <laughs> it, it exists. It has a name. Um, it's science. I miss the science. That's what I was missing this whole time. Um, and that's what actually started my journey towards, you know, pharma. So the first thing I did um, really was, okay, so now I know the MSL exists. And then... Um, how do I even go about it was my next question. And I don't know, maybe like they said, there's some spies like on your phone or something. Like once you start thinking of something, no programs, things start popping up. 
So right. I was fortunate to, to see you on TV, you know, kind of plug the ACMA. And then next thing I know, there's ACMA showing up on my timelines. And then I started looking into it and then the BCMAS. And I was like, oh. So at first, I assumed it was something for maybe people on the MSL uh, field already that maybe did not, you know, know about other cross-functional areas and giving them an opportunity to learn about other areas so that if they got, you know, laid off, they, were, they might be able to use those skills, you know, to go into other areas besides MSL. So I was just thinking a whole different thing. And then the more I looked at it, I was like, huh, I need, a, I need something like some structured program that will teach me about the industry, at least give me a working knowledge about the industry since I didn't have that as a background. And so that was when I actually, now I think back, I reached out to one of the, your associates at the time. And I said, does this actually um, pertain to aspiring MSLs? She's like, oh, definitely. You know, I've heard about a lot of people that took this program and it kind of helped them, but it depends on how you use it. And that was what gave me the validation to like, you know what, I'm going to do this program. So I went ahead to do it. And... When you, when you jumped in to get board certified in medical affairs, what were the things that you learned in the program and you were like, wow, you know, I wish I had learned it in pharmacy school? Because we hear from a lot of people that went to pharmacy school, went to medical school, or like me, you're in a PhD program, but you actually really never learned a lot of those things that you're trained on, you're taught in BCMES. Tell me about some of the things that you learned that were really useful to you. So let me go a few years back to pharmacy school. In pharmacy school, I did go to school in Philadelphia. And if you know, industry is round around us. It's, it's in Jersey, you know. And the irony of it all was I did do a clinical rotation with Johnson & Johnson during my last year of school. And that was just to see what was out there. Unfortunately for me, it was a program where I kind of shadowed different people all the way down to sales. I guess that's why the sales thing stuck in my head. Nobody talked to us about medical affairs. We had no idea that there was all these other areas where pharmacists could work in. So let me speak for myself. I had no idea. And so when I started the program, the first thing out of my mind was, oh, my God, biostatistics <laughs> i did biostatistics in school talking about p-values i'm like i always wondered back then what are we even going to do with this stuff because in my head once i was done with school i was going to go do retail like everybody else or maybe hospital at some point so once i started seeing words that made sense p-values odd ratios like things that i did in biostatistics it started to resonate like oh my god this is why we did biostatistics in school. They just didn't tell us what we're going to use it for. And so it's weird having not done it in years. And I'm reading these things. And then I'm starting to understand that, oh, my God, there's so much to the industry. There's all these different departments. There's all these different things. There's compliance, H-E-O app. I didn't know any of these things existed. And there's pharmacovigilance. I'm like, oh, my God, they're medical info. <laughs> so there was things out there. I was like, wow, the sky is the limit. But it took me taking that program to realize that, you know, even though, yeah, this MSL thing <laughs> is what I wanted to do, but there's all these other areas within the industry that people like me could actually go into as well. So that's what the program initial, that's what it did for me. Yeah, we hear that all the time. I mean, that's, that's fantastic because you know, one thing that people don't realize is that the MSL function is part of medical affairs. A lot of times when you're not in the industry, uh, you don't know that. Uh, but in reality, really, medical science liaisons are an arm, right? They're the field medical affairs function or arm of medical affairs in total. What was something when you, you know, got your position at AbbVie and you landed and became an MSL there, what was something in that, in this first year that you really learned that you think a lot of people don't realize about being a medical science liaison? It's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot of work. Um, you know, you have this thing you see on paper. And I, I'll tell you, it wasn't just the BCMS. I did some other things. 
Um, so let me go back so that will kind of put things in perspective. So when I started to apply to place, after I got my BCMAS, I started to apply and, you know, put my name out there, network with folks. For each interview that I happened to have, there was something that was missing. It wasn't just not having the MSL experience, which is always what they, you know, tell you like right on top, you know. There were so many other things, you know, you, you hadn't presented, you know, formally in like years since we did our little in-service presentations in school because I didn't need it in my, in my practice. And so what did I do? So I wrote a list of gaps that I had. Okay, how do I improve my presentation skills? Um, one of the consultants that I work with, I talked to a lot of people, her advice was, hey, join your local uh, Toastmasters club if you haven't presented in a long time. I didn't even know what a Toastmasters club was at the time. So that led me to, okay, great. So I joined this Toastmasters club, my local Toastmasters club. Luckily, it was virtual because remember, this is during COVID. And then I started to participate and I'm talking to all kinds of strangers. I'm like, I like this. <laughs> I like talking to people and, you know, evaluating people. And, you know, the, if you know anything about Toastmasters, it's, it's kind of fun. So that was my first thing I did. I was like, okay, this could help me with that a little bit. And then my next thing was, okay, I've read, you know, I've done my BCMA. So at least I have a high level idea about what goes on. But I still don't understand the role, like what, what the MSLs really, really do. I, I read it on paper, but even talking to certain people, it was kind of high level, high level. I still felt like I still didn't get it. And so that was when I was advised to talk to an MSL coach or a mentor. And so I went that route. I started working with an actual MSL coach mentor. And that was when I realized, oh, my God, there is a lot to this than, you know, what you read, you know, on paper and all that. So that helped me a little bit. And with time, it started to shape my why, because that's the main thing. Why? Why do you want to be an MSL? What is your understanding of the role? At that time, I still couldn't articulate why. I knew that's what I needed to do, but I, didn't, I couldn't articulate why. And so once I got that together, my why. When I started, um, I wouldn't say I was as overwhelmed as I thought I would be because now I kind of had an idea. It was just putting all that stuff into practice. So it, it's a lot. <laughs> a lot of work, a lot of brain work, a lot of personality work, especially now that I'm, I'm on the field. You have to have some sort of personality <laughs> to be successful. Yes, you do. It's very important. Because a lot of people call on the same exact, you know, providers that you talk to. And so you have to have personality. You have to stand out. You have to show up as not a steep. <laughs> okay. You have to come there, be able to tell a story, a compelling story. Be authentic. Be your authentic self. So that's what, you know, I took out from everything I did to prepare myself. And then when I, when I got in there and I saw it, the transition wasn't as difficult as I thought it would be. Let me put it that way. That's fantastic. Great. That's a great story. And I think a lot of people that will be listening to this and hear your journey, I think it will benefit them incredibly. What would you say for you um, is your, I guess, philosophy on how to be successful in an MSL role? Now, you talked about personality. I would, obviously, yeah. you have to know the science. But one thing that, that stuck out to me about you is that when you learned about, you know, what your gaps were, clearly you saw what your gaps were, you did something about it. You right. know, a lot of times I think we as people, we, we might know what our weakness is or what our gap is, but most people don't do anything about it, right? They don't take action. Right. Clearly you took action. So what is your, you know, your philosophy if you were going to give someone some advice who's listening, a pharmacist, a PhD, an MD, just in general, what's the philosophy that NECA has on life and in, in work in general that could you know, benefit someone who's trying to build a career in the pharmaceutical industry? So the first thing to do is know your why. Like I mentioned before, know your why. Capital, I tell everybody that reaches out to me privately on LinkedIn, 
W H Y. Why do you want to do it? Now, once you know your why, what is your understanding of that role? And once you know what your understanding of the role is, then the next question becomes, why do you even want to work for company A, B, C? Be able to articulate why you want to work for that company. Study the culture of that company. The worst thing that can happen to you is you show up in a company and their culture does not in any way align with your values. You're going to be miserable. And it's going to be a very short term. So when people say, oh, learn the culture, people think it's, uh, it's uh, you know, just cliche. No, it's not. It's very important because that, would, that could come up in an interview too. So why do you want to work for us? You can say, oh, well, I like your culture. What is our culture? <laughs> and if you, can, if you can state their culture and say, you know what? In my personal life, this is how this resonates. That will take you far. Another thing is, don't just apply to therapeutic areas just because. Have a vested interest in whatever therapeutic area. Some of these disease states, our families, our friends, you know, they live with these diseases. So, so the best, to be quite honest with you, to me, the best MSLs are the ones that can kind of relate because it's either it's something that they're dealing with personally or family or friends. So they come with a different kind of passion. So it's not just business, it's personal. So have a, at least a working knowledge about the therapeutic area you're going into. Have some passion about it. It's just not all about money. And something somebody taught me, you know, while I was, you know, in my journey trying to get in here, that was very important. And they always said, number one is the patient. Number one is the patient. Number two, trust. You want to build trust. Number three, reputation. Com There's no company that doesn't care about the reputation. And when you're out there, you know, I know I've done my disclaimer or everything, but I'm still a representative. However I conduct myself is also kind of reflective of who I work with and what work for. And then finally is the business in that order. So patient, trust, reputation, then business. So if you can put all those things together and sit down and, you know, just write something for yourself. Why do I want to do this? What, 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 what is my understanding about this role? What therapeutic area am I really interested in? And why do I even want to work for this particular company? If you can articulate that and you can convey that to whoever you're talking to in a very convincing way, you're kind of on your way. And so that, that's what I live by and that's what works for me. I love that. I love that. And thank you so much for sharing that. I'm going to ask you one last question. Who would you say had the biggest influence on your life in terms of your work ethic? Who influenced you the most? My mother. So I come from a lineage of pharmacists. My paternal grandfather was a pharmacist. My mom was a pharmacist. Two of my siblings are pharmacists. And then there's me as well. So I've always admired my mother's strength. My mom was naturally a compassionate person. She always wanted to help people. And so right when I was six years old, whatever my mother was doing, I wanted to do. I didn't know what it was called, but everybody called me little pharmacist. So whatever she was doing, I wanted to do. <laughs> and so it was just a given. And then I was told, nah, I don't remember, but a lot of people told me that I played with my dolls. I would play hospital with my dolls and, you know, give them medicine and, and things like that. So I already kind of had that in me. And one thing that stuck out, my mother, because I, I was born in Baltimore, but raised in Nigeria. And my mom, she went to school here. She, she, she got her pharmacy degree from America. But when she went back to Nigeria, so the way we practice pharmacy in Nigeria is completely different from what happened. But for some reason, she had that gift where she was always sent to rural areas to go develop their pharmacy. Like they would have pharmacies, a spot for pharmacies, but no pharmacists. So in Africa, we have, we have chemists on the road. I don't know, you know about that. There's chemists on the road, but they're not pharmacists. 
And there were not a lot of pharmacists, but my mom was tasked with, you know, going to rural hospitals and developing those pharmacists. And you know what she did with me? When I turned 16, she would take me with her in the summer. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you go to these rural areas. These people don't know what a pharmacy is. And you see the look in their faces when the work is done. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just doing whatever I was told. Like, take all this mess, put it on that shelf. Put this on here. But it was rewarding seeing the difference my mom made in people's lives. And somehow that stuff stuck in my head. And that kind of strengthened my resolve to become a pharmacist. And so when I came back, I already knew at, at the age of 19, I knew exactly what I, I had to do. All I had to do was find out the right uh, academic advisor, what do I need to do? Because I know what I want to do. I want to be a pharmacist. What I didn't know was how I was going to use that experience that I saw in Nigeria in America. Like, how would I make a difference in a lot of people's lives? I didn't know how. I did it on my own little small scale throughout my career. But now being an MSL, I feel like I can channel that same thing my mom did in a different way to make a difference for a lot of people who need us. Regardless of the, you know, negative connotations that farmer people have, you know, we give people hope. We really do. And I, I and like I said to you, I call it, we're doing God's work out here. <laughs> I love that story. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you again for joining us here at the ECMA podcast. Neka Dimonochi, Medical Science Liaison at AbbVie in the Neuroscience Division of Board, a Board Certified Medical Affairs Specialist. Thank you very much again for taking the time especially on a Sunday, and we will talk to you again. On